you, Rich. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Dr. Guy Yatros. And I'm Dr. Richard Drake. I'm the, the guy with a little bit less hair there. <laughs> well, we've been doing this a long time. Rich and I have been uh, partners and friends for for over a dozen years. We've been doing dental sleep individually in our practices for well over 15 each. So we've done thousands of devices, and uh, we don't know everything, but we've learned a few things along the way, and we hope to share that with you. We want to thank NDX, I went too fast there, for uh, helping uh, sponsor this and uh, getting some of you to know about it. Uh, we've been working with uh, NDX Labs for many years. Uh, one of my favorite devices uh, is the Clear Dream, and I, I say this all the time, and it's really one of the best values out there in dental sleep devices. It's, it's all injected acrylic, and uh, it's very, very sturdy, and the you know a little over $300. Uh, if you're getting new to uh, starting to this, uh, it's a good device to start with. And a lot of you know the, the NDX uh, labs for their NTI. We still, um, oftentimes when patients do have uh, TMD and dental uh, sleep problems, we uh, will treat them with the NTI initially to get them uh, asymptomatic before we, we go with their uh, mandibular advancement device. So uh, NDX lab, great, a uh, bunch of people there. If you have questions, certainly reach out to us or them and one, our last sponsor, and we'll try to get right to it, is is KKGI. Um, I could talk for an hour, and I just did that not too long ago, didn't I, Rich, at the um, symposium uh, about why I got involved in, uh, in dental sleep uh, and, 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 and what uh, uh, 3D means to my practice. So we want to thank them, and if you're uh, involved in or thinking about getting a CBCT unit, uh, think about getting uh, talking to the people at Instrumentarium and also uh, think about getting a unit big enough that we can see the airway with. Which I'll, I'll shut up for a minute and let you talk about our mission. Yeah, we're, you know, Dental Sleep Solutions, like Guy said, we started this, uh, oh gosh, getting close to a decade now, and, and uh, we're the most trusted, innovative, customer focused provider of solutions in dental sleep medicine, period. I mean, that's, that's what we do. We try to be the trendsetters, we try to be ahead of the curve. Uh, Guy and I started this entire business just to help dentists learn how to do this and we spend most of our lives doing it. So DS3 is the, the, the software that is the backbone of what we do, but it's certainly not all that we do. We, we have an unbelievable amount of education built into the web-based platform. It really is an end-to-end -end, um, uh, patient management system. You know, where do you put sleep studies? Where do you, how do you keep track of this stuff? You know, do you, when you're titrating somebody, what where are they? And it's just it's just a great great system that we put together. And if you're uh, whether you're just getting started, you've been doing this for a long time. You 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 should look at it. And we're we're doing a number of courses this year. I don't know how many that is, guy, but that's a lot. Right. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I, uh, we'll get right to it in a second. But I will mention there's a, quite a few screenshots of our system through here. If you if you just want to try it out, just type in uh, tonight uh, trial, and uh, you can talk to our people. You can try it. Look at our education we have and no pressure, take a look at what we have. And if you want to come to one of these courses, uh, uh, if you type into the question box uh, course, you'll get $50 off a of one day and 200 off of a two day course. And we have even more courses than are listed here uh, that hopefully uh, get some of you people out if you're really interested in doing this in your offices. So that's what we do at Dental Sleep Solutions. Uh, we, we are passionate about what we do, but we really want to get to the point and talk about getting uh, dental sleep going in your practices. And our courses this year are called the four pillars of dental sleep. So if you have a system and uh, a team member in your office or team members who are accountable for this and you have systems to screen, test, treat, and bill your patients, uh, you're going to be successful in dental sleep. And to break down those parts a little further, uh, it's not, not complicated, is it, Rich, when we, we each one of these steps. Uh, if you, look, we made this slide kind of like a step. Um, is there anything on here that's more difficult than a root canal? No, if you can learn how to do a root canal, you can learn how to do this. But I, I think you said the right word there, Guy, is systems. And, and I think that's probably why most of you are on here tonight, is to learn about this patient flow. You know, how do you start a patient? Well, here, here we have it. You know, we just walk this patient through. We're, we're going to screen them in our practice, and we got to get them tested. You know, can we treat somebody without testing them? Yeah, but we don't want to. 
and we do consults and, and we image them and we, we look at their insurance and, and you know there's a lot of stuff to do there guy before we actually take impressions you know, that's one thing we want to get you, you guys to see and, and then then we can deliver the device then we do a few follow-ups and then we want to get them back for a titration sleep study but that that slide right there is is mentally you guys need to write those steps down because these are the steps we're going to talk about tonight and this if, if you put something like this together uh, you will be successful if you have a system for how to keep track of this stuff and how to do it and we're just going to give you some pointers and and tips and things that we've learned over the years as we go through each one of these steps yeah and it used to take when I first started doing this two three hours a patient maybe longer because we didn't have good systems and I can promise you if you have good systems in place you can do this in about 45 minutes of doctor time uh, Rich and I have spent I would think less than that I know in my office it's probably 30 minutes not probably because we track it it is around 30 guy, minutes of my time. He's not telling stories guy just says hey you do this and you do that <laughs> it doesn't even take him five minutes to do all this. Because we're going to talk about the sleep ambassador and if you have a good team members most of the things that need to be done in dental sleep can be completed by auxiliaries so it, it's something that once they're trained and the systems are up and running it can run in the background of your practice. Now we're not going to spend all night talking about why sleep apnea is bad but I think it's important to at least mention it uh, at the beginning of this webinar that everything on your screen here uh, is independently associated with untreated sleep apnea. In other words, the sleep apnea is actually a causative factor. And I don't think we want anything from heart attacks to impotence to obesity to GERD. All these things uh, are, are the manifestations of untreated sleep apnea. And I think it's important for us to realize that, you know, there's two real treatments for sleep apnea. One is CPAP and the other is dental devices. And uh, as we look at how bad apnea is for it, I think that'll come into play what I just said there. This is one of my favorite studies that shows a thousand uh, uh, state employees in, in Wisconsin that have been looking, uh, having a follow-up sleep test for over uh, uh, almost 20 years. And what they're just looking at is saying, hey, are these people still alive? Who we we did a sleep test on, and the people down here at the bottom. I'll just put this, this, uh, the what these numbers mean in case you don't know. Pushing 20 years, the people who had severe apnea. 57 percent are still alive. That means 43 percent aren't uh, roughly. But if you look at compared to, to to normal, which is 95, and mild to moderates in the high uh, the mid to, to, to high 80s, depending on where we are there. And I think the important part of this, Rich, is don't you most of the time if you have someone with severe apnea can we can most of the time get them at least up into this uh, higher category of, uh, of, of or higher survival rate, rather lower apnea uh, with a dental device. Yeah, well, I mean, if if I get you from that bottom curve up to the next one, you know, I probably added ten years to your life. So, right. uh, yeah, that's you know, if I just get it from thirty-one to twenty-nine and. This is tell us about this study that just came well, out. Well, this just right? this just came out last fall, and I just first saw it not too long ago. And and here's what we've been saying for a long time, and and, and the truth is is out there. This is a huge trial, over 2,500, so 2,687 uh, people, and they've been studying them for over three years. And what they're showing is when it looks like we're trying to prevent heart attacks and cardiovascular incidents that uh, whether people are given a CPAP or not really has no difference as the controls. Really the conclusion of the study is that the CPAP did not significantly reduce occurrence of serious cardiovascular events in non-sleepy patients. It helped their sleepiness some, uh, but with these patients with moderate to severe apnea, uh, they're no more healthy from a, a cardiovascular point of view than if they weren't given a CPAP. They're not sure why this is, but it's very likely the study also revealed that less than four hours a night these patients are wearing it. So uh, again, that's not what this is all about, but I think it's important if we're talking about treatment that we understand what treatment is and that uh, this is straight from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine's practice parameters as it pertains to dental devices uh, that they came out with in 2015. And it's showing that as much as 83% of the patients are non-adherent and the, we're looking at the, the mean disease alleviation calculations that dental devices may be comparable to CPAP. And the reason we talk about this at the beginning is because dental devices work really well for mild to moderate apnea and for severe apnea they work really well at getting uh, severe apnea up to that mild to moderate and if the people actually wear it, uh, which we know compliance rates are far higher, uh, dental devices uh, are starting to look more and more like the, the treatment of the future and we have to understand 
successful treatment doesn't always mean getting the apneic level to less than five. If we get someone from 30 to, to 10, that's a pretty big accomplishment. It's especially if they'll wear it. You know, that, that, that's the biggest difference. People will wear our dental devices and people don't want to wear a CPAP. So it's not us versus them. We don't want to, we don't want to talk bad about CPAP because a lot of our patients wear CPAP, don't they, Guy? And, and sometimes yes. they wear it with the dental device and sometimes they switch nights and stuff like this. But, you know, we, we, we kind of glanced over that slide about heart attacks and strokes and all that other stuff. And, uh, by the way, Guy, I didn't see anything on that list that I would like to have. No. But, uh, yeah. you know, we, we cannot stress enough how meaningful it is to do this. I mean, patients come in and they just, it's like, man, you have just changed my life. I mean, I, I just, I had forgotten what it was like to sleep and feel better and, you know, all this other kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's the right thing to do and it's very meaningful work. And we, you, you, you're on this webinar, so you're thinking about it, and that's a good thing. And, uh, you know, they keep, the, the insurance payers keep saying, hey, you dentists, if you don't go to an EMR, we're going to start penalizing you. They've been saying that for three years, and they keep bumping it back because so many dentists are slow to adopt this. But you really need to move towards an electronic medical record. And can I tell my story, Guy, about yeah, why? Yeah, put a slide in here for you. I don't know if you knew this one yeah. was in here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, we're, I'm teaching a course in Omaha, and I get on a plane and fly to Dallas first, and when I get off the plane, I turn my phone on, I got 20 messages, and I'm just not that popular, and the first one is, hey, Rich, uh, this is Barry, I'm at the gym, I'm watching your office burn down on the news. <laughs> what? <laughs> so, yeah, that's a true story, you know, about three and a half years ago, my office burned, but I didn't lose one bit of data, uh, because I used DS3, and it's backed up every 90 seconds to the cloud, and, and you know, hopefully you're backing up your stuff, and you're taking it off-site, and, uh, you know, we want you guys to push towards using electronic medical records. So, Absolutely. Yeah, here are the four pillars. We talk about screening, testing, doing that. So, uh, Guy, tell us, you know, describe uh, who that sleep ambassador in your practice might be. Right. And I think I'll say first, um, we, we train hundreds of offices each year how to do this, and we, we help them in various ways. And I think the number one thing we can help you with is convince you that this is probably a good idea. Uh, I don't think I've seen an office yet who's made the commitment to have a dedicated person, team member in their office, we call them the sleep ambassador, that that's a big part of their job, if not their only job. And if they make that commitment, those offices just basically explode in dental sleep. They, they uh, go from wherever they were to now they're so busy that they're having to add more and more people on and the sky's really the limit. So you don't have to do this to be successful. But someone has to own a lot of the, these parts we're going to go over here in a few minutes. And it's a lot easier if it's one person. So if you're going to look with one person, it may not even be a dental uh, uh, assistant. It may be someone who worked in the medical field. maybe someone who works at uh, Starbucks. And, and, and the person we're going to look for is organized. They want to learn. They're articulate. Uh, they've got to be a multitasker, and, and they've got to have a little bit of fire coming out of their hair. You know, they want to be a, some, some initiative behind them. Uh, they've got to be responsible, of course, and responsive. And their goal is to manage this. Uh, they need to, to work uh, and become the local dental sleep medicine expert. Uh, and they have to understand these patient flow. And if you train this person, again, most of the things that you need to accomplish for these patients uh, do not require direct uh, interaction with the dentist. So the staff members can take care of a lot of them. So this is the type of person we're looking for. We find them everywhere from, like I said, Starbucks to medical offices to, to friends. Uh, and uh, it doesn't have to be someone uh, that's in the office already. You can find someone outside the office. So um, anything to add on that, Rich? No, that was good. I, you, you uh, The employee you described, I would love to have four or five of those myself. Yeah. Well, it's not always easy to find a great team members, but the good news is when you look outside the dental field, you don't have to have someone with dental training. It I, I opens think, up more people to the, to the workforce. You have a bigger pool of candidates to look at. Yeah, I, I think that's a good, very good point, Guy, is that you don't, they don't have to be a dental assistant. They just need no. to be organized and, and have a little bit of fire underneath them, like, uh, like you said. Right. And there, there are a lot of moving parts to this, and... Uh, you know, like anything that you're going to do, uh, anything that's, that's not a strong link in that has the potential 
to make this thing stop in the middle. You can be real good at screening, but if you don't have a system for how to help those people get tested, then you never get to the next step. So we, we want to talk about these systems now for how we do this, but, but there are a few moving parts. That slide that I showed them again where we walk this person through these steps, any one of these is not insurmountable. But, but there are several steps, and you've got to be thorough. And you, you, like Guy said, if you've got somebody that owns sleep in your practice and will, will help organize this and, and, and get this going, then it really makes it work, work better. Okay. Well, where do these patients come from? Uh, I can just tell you that it is so rewarding when we train other dentists uh, and dental law team members, probably even more so. And if you just start looking around, they're everywhere. I mean, they're. Uh, if you just start mentioning it, next time you're at a uh, church or a party or playing golf, and people say, "What do you do?" Say, "Oh, I, you know, I help people snore and sleep apnea," and just see the response because there's so many people everywhere, and so. We can spend. We can do a whole webinar or series of webinars on, on, uh, on marketing and finding patients. But let's let's start with our patients we care about. If you care about your patients, uh, they're there. You you care about their oral health, I hope, and uh, we hopefully care about their overall health. And if we start with looking at them and and, and trying to decide, maybe some of them already have CPAP and can't wear it, or they're in that 3.2 hours a night or less. Uh, maybe some of them don't know they have apnea. And if we can start with them, we're going to help them. And we're also going to help generate patients, which is going to generate revenue. If we're not doing this, where it's just like money, as you can see, flying out the door. How do we do this? Well, we could do a whole webinar on screening, but uh, I put these together with Rich's help years ago. And uh, you got to have a system for basically quickly identifying these patients. Anything? I mean, we can go into extreme detail, but we really don't have time. What do you What do you want to say about the red flags, Rich? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're already doing some of this in your practice. Every time your hygiene patients come in, they should be asked, well, any changes in your health history? Well, actually, I had a heart attack a couple of months ago. Oh, red flag. You know, well, I'm, flag. I'm taking high blood pressure medicine now. Oh, red flag. You know, so we're, we're, I think you're doing a part of this already. And then when we see people with big necks and their airways are crowded and they're grinding their teeth, you know, like we said, we'd talk any one of these topics we could talk about for an hour. But... Here are the red flags that you're doing this. Now let's get a little bit more specific about how you can actually screen them. Yeah, and there's a lot of different screening uh, questionnaires out there. We'll talk about ours in a minute. But regardless of how you do this, if you go through these steps, you will be much more successful. So we keep talking about steps. Well, now this is the screening step, and it has its own steps. In order to do this, we have to identify the patients who are at risk. So we need a quick way to look at these red flags and say, hey, this person's at risk and uh, we need to talk to them. Someone needs to talk to them. Maybe the sleep ambassador uh, needs to talk to them. And once they talk to the patient, the goal of that is for the patient to understand, hey, I am at risk for this. No one wants all that stuff we saw on the previous page uh, earlier in the presentation. And they have to agree to test them. Now, let's don't jump down to treat. That's the biggest mistake people do is they start saying, hey, it looks like you have apnea and you're snoring. Let me show you a dental device. No, let's, 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 we don't know. Let's, let's get them. Let's see what's going on with their airway. And somewhere along the way, we're going to have to probably decide how much is this going to cost them, too. We'll, we'll talk about that briefly at the, at the end of this. So regardless of your screening system, you need a way to quickly identify them, a way to talk to our patients to acknowledge it, and then you need a system for testing. We have taken some of uh, the more popular screening uh, of things like Epworth Sleepiness Scores, uh, Scales, rather, Epworth Sleepiness Scale, I should say, and uh, uh, AASM Screener. You could use uh, Stop Bang. There's a lot of them out there. But we, we, we took a, a few of these and put them in uh, a digital format just to make it real easy for the patient just to go through and answer some questions. And after they answer the questions, uh, they, they put their name in it, and they got a tablet in their hand typically. And if they're at high risk, then uh, we, we see something that looks like this. Uh, and I think the, the advantage to doing it this way is we gather the data all together, which is really great, and we can come back to it. But the other is, Rich, what, what do your patients say when they see this tablet that says severe risk here? Severe risk? What am I at severe risk for? That's exactly, right. well, what do I do about this? You know, what, what, what am I at risk for? And that's exactly what we want them to do is to ask that question. 
Uh, we figured out a way where you just click a button. Well, you're at severe risk because your F were sleeping a scale. You were 19. You're very sleepy during the day. Your health issues. Here's the questions that you answered yes to. These are all related in some way to sleep disordered breathing. So the algorithm that's in this, this screener here is just trying to assess your risk of sleep disordered breathing. Well, what, what do I have it? What, what do I do? Is there a test for it? Well, yeah, that's the whole goal. And this, again, can be done by the sleep ambassador, by your hygienist, by the dentist themselves. And the goal of this conversation is to understand the results here and to talk to them where they say just what Rich said. Well, what does this mean? How do I know? And then that's easy. We say, you know, you need to get a test. And it's a pretty simple test. You know, people don't want tests. They know they're used to, you know, having uh, biopsies or uh, tests that cause radiation maybe. And, and this test is pretty simple. Uh, we have two tests for you. Um, one is you can go in the sleep lab and you can spend the night in the sleep lab with, uh, uh, with some various facilities we could refer you to and they're going to manage uh, going to going to uh, manage this data and look and see if you're breathing well or not. We're just trying to see if you're breathing and if your oxygen's going down. The other way is we can send you home with a little portable monitor. We can work with your primary care. We'll talk about how we do that in just a second. But you can go home with a, a test that's about the size of your iPhone or Droid phone, whatever kind of phone you have, and it measures whether you're breathing well at night. It measures if you're snoring and it measures if your oxygen levels are dropping down at night. So. Uh, which way would you like to do it, Rich? That's the way we, I usually say to the patient, you want, need a test, we can do one of these two tests, which way would you like? Not, not yeah. do you want to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I'm probably going to do the one my insurance pays for. Well, that's true. Can I, can I say something, Guy? I, I want everybody out there to, to think back to what Guy just said. Guy did not use big words. He didn't say, Hey, your apnea, you know, and you have this and hypopneas and things like that. He just made it very simple. It's like, hey, are you breathing or not? You know, is it affecting your sleep? Is your blood oxygen going down? That's hard on your heart and your brain and all this other stuff. So keep it simple. You know, we just want to get people. We're identifying them. We're getting them to acknowledge that they have a problem, and now we're going to try to get them tested. Uh, we, it's like your kids sitting there at the dinner, you know, getting ready to eat dinner. You don't say, you know, are you going to eat your broccoli or not? You, you say, you going to eat the broccoli or the carrots? Yep. Now we we give them a choice. Do you want this test or that test? And most of the time, you're right. They'll choose which one their insurance pays. And more and more, insurances are gravitating towards a home sleep test. Excuse me, and the patients would typically prefer, prefer a home sleep test. So oh, before I give you the answer here, there's always a question about which one's more accurate. And um, I like asking this question in person when we do our in-person courses. And usually I make people vote and, you know, which one's more accurate. And uh, to cut to the chase, you know, they're both accurate. Um, a PSG is uh, maybe we have some more data. So we have a little more accurate test because we measure your brain waves and some things that we don't measure with the home test, although that really doesn't tell us if you're breathing well anyway. But it may be more accurate because we have people monitoring it, but you're not sleeping as well, so it's a less accurate night's sleep. And a home sleep test is a less accurate test because we have a little less data. I don't know if it's actually less accurate, but it's less data of a more accurate night's sleep. And so the question is what trumps what? Uh, we do know if you don't sleep well, you underestimate the apnea. So if you don't get to the deeper sleep because you're you're not sleeping well, maybe because you've got 15 wires coming out of you, uh, you may not catch the apnea. And again, Rich is right that really it's the, what the patient wants and what the insurance will, will pay for. The point of this slide is don't feel that a home sleep test is is, is, is shoddy uh, diagnosis. Uh, in my personal belief, it's yeah. actually more accurate in many ways. In many ways it is. And if you, if you don't sleep, well, how are we going to measure your sleep apnea if you can't sleep? And that's... Yeah. You know, a big the problem. Of a bad problem. night's sleep doesn't give us much information. Yeah, uh, exactly. You know, at all. If you're going to use a home sleep test, and this is, you know, open up for, uh, the, you know, a can of worms here if we're not careful. Uh, we'll try to, to keep the can of worms as close as we can. But anyone can refer to a local physician. So we'll jump down to number three. You can, uh, you can you work with a local sleep lab who dispenses these. You can call the primary care and say, I want to get this patient a home sleep test. So that one anybody can do. And that's what we do for our Medicaid patients. Now, the other two, depending on your state laws and your interpretation of state laws, uh, some dentists feel, feel comfortable uh, to, uh, to 
give uh, th their patients a, an order for these sleep tests. And uh, they're in, in the state of Florida, I, I feel comfortable doing that. Uh, I know Rich does in, in Texas as well. And so again, most states uh, don't say that you can't do this. And so how do we do it if we want to use a home sleep test and we as dentists want to order it? Well, I'll just go up from the bottom up. We can uh, use a company. This is my preference, a way that we can just refer to a company that we uh, s send them a referral form or, or in DS3, we just have a button you click. And uh, that test is given to the patient. The patient's insurance uh, is managed by that company. So they, they bill the patient directly. They manage the patient's insurance or bill their insurance. And then they have a, a physician who diagnoses uh, and, uh, and, and sends that back to you and their primary care. Uh, the, other, the last way is you can buy your own that piece of equipment. That's pretty easy, by the way. Yeah, why, why not do that? You can buy your own piece of equipment, but then you've got to get that data to a physician to make a diagnosis. What I want to make really clear is we can't make a diagnosis. We can, in, in, in all cases, refer to physicians. In most cases, we can help, in a lot of the cases, we can help get the device in the, in the hands of the patients, but the physicians have to make uh, the diagnosis. Uh, we make that really simple in DS3 for the clients who want it. We have a quick little button and you can actually just order the home sleep test and it sends all that information to a third party uh, home sleep testing company who has physicians on board in every state and they can uh, uh, get your patients tested. So uh, I like just clicking the button myself. What about you, Rich? Yeah, there are various, there are absolutely various ways to do it. If you have a home sleep testing device, we can help show you how to use that and how to do that. Uh, but you don't have to go out and buy one. So we have tried to lower the barriers. That's what that's what Dental Sleep Solutions does. We're trying to lower the barriers so that you have an easy system to screen people. Now we had this talk to them, and they go, "Hey, I, you know, what do I do about it? I need a test." Okay, we want your sleep ambassador in your practice to help that patient, help facilitate that test for that patient. You know, our practices, uh, our, our member dentists who are very successful, they don't just go, hey, you should go get a sleep study. I'll see you in six months when we clean your teeth again. No, they help them do this. So we're trying to give you a couple of different ideas here about how your sleep ambassador can help facilitate that. Right. And, and if the patient wants or their insurance only pays for a PSG, we're fine with that too. We just want to get down to this next uh, pillar where we, we want to help our patients. And sometimes this help is referring them for CPAP. Most of the time it's not. Uh, most of the time we can treat these patients. And uh, we're not just doing this, I hope you gather, to just increase our practice revenues, which undoubtedly it will do. But you, we're doing this because it's the right thing to do and we're going to help our patients out. And you're going to really build your other parts of your practice as you start treating these patients because uh, not, not much you can do as a dentist, if anything at all, uh, can you have as near as a profound of an effect on their whole overall life. So before we treat them, uh, we've got to now talk to them about the fact that they have apnea uh, or maybe they already knew it and they, they, they just couldn't wear their CPAP. Um, you know, this might be the biggest hurdle for some dentists, uh, either getting the patients to, to get tested or, or getting uh, them to agree to treatment, the two basically consultation. Would you agree with that, Rich? I would agree with that. Yeah, I mean, yes. we, we used to teach this all about which devices you use and where and all that stuff first, and really what we found, if we can get dentists to believe and, 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 and get their patients screened and have a system to get them tested, that's the first big hurdle. And then the second big hurdle is once they're tested and have a diagnosis, getting them to, uh, to, to go forward with treatment. Uh, the rest of the stuff you know how to do. It's taking impressions. It's putting acrylic in someone's mouth. I mean, there's some stuff, a uh, few things we're going to teach you in a few minutes, but for the most part, that's the easy part. So to do a successful consultation, I think the reason people don't succeed at that to the level that we would hope they would is because uh, they're not prepared. And what we teach is that you've got to be prepared. Uh, what I mean by that is we have to have three things in order. We have to have a, a, a diagnosis, and we need to know what's going on with their airway so we can talk to them about that. We need to know what's going on with their symptoms. That's what that sleep questionnaire is. And we also need to know what we're going to tell them when the patient says, how much is this? So if we're going to deal with medical insurance, then we need to know how we're going to do that. If we're not going to deal with medical insurance, we need to know that. So if we have these three things in order prior to the test, we can have a really, really meaningful consultation. And then... Uh, 
Uh, this is something Rich and I put together years ago, and long before we had it digital, we did it on paper. And I can just tell you, I can't imagine just having a sleep test in my hand and walking into a room. We dissect that sleep test and pull out all the data that you see here on the screen so that we can very quickly and easily reference it and have a meaningful conversation about what's going on with that patient's airway, what's, what's happening. Uh, you want to go through it in detail, Rich, or what do you think? No, I don't think we need to. You know, we're 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 at a at a bigger overview here, and I know we got a lot of slides to get through. So, but but you you said a couple of things, guy, there that uh, that really hit home to me. And before you do a consultation, you've got to be prepared. And if you're prepared, you have the sleep study, you have the diagnosis, you have a questionnaire that's been done about very specifically related to sleep. That includes TMD questions and all these kinds of things. Now I can sit down and I can have a very intelligent conversation with the patient about this. And, and this is just a way to organize it. This is our summary sheet where we look at sleep testing and we have all of these things. So we're just looking at, at how many times you quit breathing, how low your oxygen went, how long it stayed there, were you on your back or your side, you know, low oxygen is not a good thing. So again, we don't have to use big words when we do this, but we're, we're, we're getting prepared to do the consultation and this is one of the things that you have to have. Because there's really two reasons to treat sleep apnea. One is from a health standpoint, so we want to get as much air to the lungs as we can. So that's what this is. That's what this review of the sleep test is. And the other is for symptoms. Uh, we want to know what sleep-related symptoms that patient has and can we help them. And then later on, we're going to see if we did help them. So uh, we do this through a web portal. So the patients actually fill all this information out before they come in. They click a button and we have it all summarized for us on the computer. Uh, if we go through this information ahead of time and we have it, it will save an enormous amount of time at the consultation in addition to having much better consultations because if you just go in and say, how are you doing? Fine. Okay. Or they'll tell you everything you didn't want to know too. I mean, you have two extremes there, right? You have the patient that won't be quiet and then the one that won't tell you anything. And we really want to get down to the point of what, what is going on. So these are the three categories and I'm going to kind of go through this fairly quickly, uh, the actual in particulars, because like Rich said, we're at a high level here, but we want to have the subjective things, the, what, is, what is going on, snoring, sleepiness, what else have you tried for this, and then we need a health history, which I'm not going to spend any time on, but we need that as part of our, of our MRI, uh, 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 medical uh, EMR, rather not MRI. Uh, so again, I'm not going to go through the details in a ton, but you just want to know what's their chief complaints, what are their other complaints, uh, all this information so we have something to talk about, snoring, gasping, GERD. Uh, Rich, this is what we go through with each of our patients every time they come in is to see how well they're doing. Uh, you and I spend hours at, on this. Yeah, we do this at each follow-up too, but you know, as we're, we're trying to titrate their dental devices and do this, we establish a baseline with this. How sleepy are you? How tired are you? Your energy level, your sleep quality, how many times you get up at night, um, headaches, do you, do you have them how often? Do you have a partner, same room, you know, do they, how often do they see you quit breathing? So again, this is our baseline. And when I go in for a consultation guy and I have looked through all of this that the patient's already done on the portal, I say, hey, look, thank you so much for filling Oops. that out. I feel like I already know you. This is some of the information that I have from your sleep study. Here's the numbers. This is subjectively. This is what you're complaining about. Here are some of the other things. You've tried CPAP. You had some real issues with it. We can actually use this one with insurance as well for an affidavit for CPAP intolerance. So again, I'm pretty well organized if I've got all this stuff. Yeah, and we know if they're wearing sleep out. We know their symptoms. You know, if they're uh, maybe we're going to do combination therapy and if this helps, or maybe they're severe and they're not wearing the CPAP at all. All that information is important before we have a, a, a consultation. And certainly, when asking to try a dental device before, because I know this from inserting my own foot in my mouth before, because uh, I didn't ask this question, and later on they. They shared with me that they tried an over-the-counter one that had some problems, and you know, wouldn't it have been nice to have known that uh, prior to me even walking in the room? And again, all this information, previous treatments, surgeries, weight loss, uh, we want to know all that uh, before they come uh, into the office. And so now I'm going to walk into that room. I know what's going on with their airway from a measurable standpoint. 
with the sleep test. I know what their symptoms are, at least the ones they noted, and we've got a really good place to start. What are you, what are you trying to accomplish here? What are, you, are, you, are we trying to reduce your snoring? Is that what's motivating you? Are you wanting to sleep better? Are you or is, you're upset or worried because maybe uh, you, you had a heart attack and you, and you know this could be helpful for it? All those things are important to know. And the goal of this consultation is to identify what the patient wants out of treatment, make sure you're in agreement on that, and to get them to say, yeah, this is something I want to do if they're a good candidate for it. And hopefully they're going to ask the magic thing. A lot of people hate it when patients ask how much it is, but for me that means the patient wants it, right? You don't ask how much the car is unless it's something you want. You don't look at the lime green pinto and say how much you want for that thing, right? <laughs> you know how old I am, right? My dad had a lime green pinto. That's why I say that. But anyway, uh, it was actually blue. But uh, you know, and we got to have an answer to that. So when they ask how much it is, uh, uh, we need to know if we're going to deal with medical insurance or if we're not. If we're just doing cash, we need to we need to have an answer because uh, because that's music to my ears when a patient asks, you know, how much it is because that means they they want the treatment. We just got to uh, make sure they can afford it and work out the finances. Anything on that, Rich? Very good. Excellent. All right. Well, so that's all the things we need. I think we just hammered that. Consultation, you know, it may take 40 minutes. It may take 10. We, we, we run about 30 minutes with this. Uh, but, again, this is hardly any of my time. I mean, the only thing I have to do is come in and not mess it up with my sleep ambassador. You know, she, she's already got the patient all ready to, to go, and I, she'll say, just go in and say this, this, and this, and uh, they're ready to go. You know, they have a couple of questions, and I just want to make sure that I'm a live, breathing human doctor, uh, and uh, and then they're going to go forward. So when we say 20 to 40 minutes, uh, you know, that's not of my time. Again, your time can be minimized. So as we've walked up through here, we've gotten up to the consultation, and honestly, the rest of this we're going to go through, but it's it's the part you dentists are, and dental teams are comfortable with. You're used to doing impressions and do an exam. The exam's a little different we'll get into, so uh, what data you might need and what things you might want to look at that's a little different, too. Anything else on that, Rich? No, nope, that's good. So we're, we're getting all of that information together, and we're trying to walk that patient right through from we've identified a patient, we've got him sleep tested, we've got all this information, we're going to do a consultation, and we're going to be laser focused. That's what I tell my staff every single day I tell my team we are going to be laser focused with every single patient we're not going to let them get off and you know people start telling me about their foot problem I say stop you know unless it affects your sleep I don't particularly want to hear about it but, but stay focused on that so that you can stay on time your, your team doesn't want you to get behind and, and you're just it actually makes you look more competent Absolutely. I mean, we, 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 you didn't touch on that guy. Uh, you did say one of the things you said earlier that I really liked was this will help you grow your dental practice because you, when you do this and people walk into our office and like, holy cow, man, I, I want to come to you and have my dental work done. Well, I don't do dental work anymore, but, but that's how they feel because we, we portray everything that we portray as confidence and competence, and it's just because we're organized and we have a system that's in place. Right. And uh, speaking of on time, it looks like uh, quite a few more people joined. So just uh, I see there's a question about the CE. You will get the CE from NDX and a couple other announcements too. Uh, we'll show you some courses at the end. And if you uh, want to come to one of our in-person courses, just type in the course, uh, no obligation, but type it in to secure a $50 uh, off of a, a one-day course or 200 off of a two-day. And we'll also give you an opportunity if you want to do a trial of our system which has a lot of this education built right in that you can just try it out for a week or two, just type in trial. So as far as the exam goes, I, we don't need to spend a ton of time on, on this part. You need x-rays, you need photographs, and, and we need to do an exam which we are going to spend time. I do use the comb beam now because I can see their airway, the nasal airway, the TMJ, and it uh, also gives a great uh, uh, super panel that actually comes out of the same image that works fantastic in my office. So again, if you're looking to get a comb beam and you're looking to do sleep, Look at the instrumentarium one in addition to, to making sure you get one that's big enough to do sleep. But uh, we do need x-rays to, to see if the teeth are strong enough. And we want to do look at the teeth and see if we think they're going to move or break or something like that. Uh, but for the most part, uh, the dental exam, you, you all know how to do this. What's different is we want to look 
at the teeth and the airway. And as we're doing this, it helps us decide which device we might want to do. It helps us note things for medical insurance. It helps us note things that might uh, be part of the problem with the airway. So tongue size, for instance, you know, is that tongue, what do, how would you describe that, Rich? That's a big old tongue, isn't it? Man. <laughs> <laughs> Large scalloped, above the clusal plane, lots of things we can look at, look at on these uh, as we're looking at the tongue. So we go through, we look at the various anatomy. Uh, we have a little bullet points that make it a lot easier. You just can check enlarged or scalloped or above the clusal plane or it looks like it attracts into the opening. Uh, I'm going to go through these fairly quickly because uh, this is just part of the exam. As we go further into the mouth, we start looking back at the soft palate and the uvula. And we look, you know, look at that top picture uh, versus, let me close this dashboard here, uh, versus this, uh, this lower one. I mean, you can just see uh, the difference in the airway. Uh, there. Uh, imagine what happens when that person falls asleep and all that tissue is totally relaxed. So we might want to describe that uvula as elongated, uh, edematous, battered. And we might have some what we call lateral pharyngeal narrowing here as we're looking uh, at this uh, airway uh, that it could be obstructive. <clears throat> tonsils, we might want to do a tonsillar grading. There's a tonsillar grading system that uh, is standardized zero through four, four meaning they touch in the middle. Uh, this one's close to a four, uh, uh, zero meaning they're surgically missing, and then kind of in between, uh, we might want to describe that. And you can just write that all out in a soap note, or what we've done is just made it easier by having little check boxes, so you can just go, oh, the tonsils look like that, so we'll just uh, check the, the grade three on that. Um, as we're looking at the other parts of the anatomy, uh, Rich and I did a course uh, uh, at our symposium a uh, weekend before last, and uh, we talked about device selection, and a lot of this stuff's real important for that, isn't it, Rich? Which which particular device we might want to use as we're doing? Yeah, because our arch narrow is that is it vaulted? And how I do this guy in my office, my assistant's sitting there with the with the computer, and she just goes maxilla, and I say vaulted, it's narrow. Uh, there is a maxillary torus present. Uh, the mandible, well, it's a little bit small. There is a posterior crossbite on the left side. Uh, it's a class two occlusion. There are mandibular tori present as well. Soft palate, very long. You know, uvula. She just goes right down that list, and I'm just, I'm just reeling them off. And I mean, we get, we do an unbelievable exam in under five minutes. You know, we yeah. look at all this, but, but a lot of that's because it's, it's right there, and it's so well organized. And it's not that we're just gathering data to gather data. We're gathering data to help us decide which device uh, we're going to do. We're gathering data. To, as part of the diagnostic process to look at this uh, anatomy, are there other parts of the anatomy that maybe uh, if the tonsils are class four, we might want to talk about that that is something they may have to address. We're looking at the nose to see if uh, at least having them breathe through their nose. If you have cone beam, then that's one of the great uses for it. As we breathe through the nose, we're looking at uh, maybe that needs to be addressed. And we're also doing this to part of our uh, our, uh, our medical record if we're going to be doing billing and that we need to, 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 to make sure that we do that. Uh, the nose, I think, is real important. Uh, Rich taught me that a long time ago that, wow, people do much better with dental devices or CPAP if you can breathe through your nose. And if they can't breathe through their nose well, and I don't know if you all have, if you can see my, the web camera, you can see my nose has had a few issues over the years. And, uh, you know, people like myself, certain devices work better for, and we just uh, will, if you don't have a way of examining the nose, you can just have them breathe through their nose. And, plug up one side of the, the outside of the nares and, and, and see if the air is going through. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I see someone making fun of my nose on there. That's, uh, it's okay. I broke a guy's fist with it years ago. So uh, it's, <laughs> I can breathe through one side just fine. Don't you worry. Uh, but uh, the nose is important. So all this information we're gathering for those three purposes. And then as we kind of come uh, towards the end of our exam, we're looking at the muscles. And we have a ton of muscles here. Uh, listed. Um, I personally just really look at the, the at some of the, the the bigger ones, the masseter, temporalis, medial pterygoid, whatever your training is there, just to see if something's sore ahead of time. Uh, I think more importantly is the, is the joint that we really do a thorough uh, uh, our exam on it. What what muscles do you, uh, Rich? Do you just do you look at all those over here that we had on the screen or? No, no, I don't look at all of them, but I consistently I'll palpate the masseters and I'll do the temporalis and then I'll. I'll do the sternocleidomastoid, and then I, if they're 
sensitive at all or there are any kind of TMJ issues, I'll do the pterygoids. I kind of go inside the mouth and do that. But, but again, you know, it's all there if you want to do it, and it depends on how sophisticated you want to be with all of that stuff. So, you know, do whatever you feel comfortable with. But I, I think you should do that at a minimum, and I don't know if that's all I do, guy, because I'm old and lazy or I just don't think I need to do it. I just anything. don't know it's that important. I mean, if they don't have active uh, muscles yeah. that are firing, uh, then I don't think it's not necessary. And then we're going to do a clinical exam or Doppler stethoscope, uh, JVA analysis, whatever you use for your joint. Uh, and again, any imaging you might have. And we're just going to look for clicking, popping, crepitus. And the truth of the matter is most of these things are not contraindications in my opinion. It's my opinion. There's people who might argue that, but they, let's see. Uh, let's see the research that shows it because there's not. These these the joints do better with mandibular advancement devices often, but we at least want to know where they are to start with. You know, if we do have any clicking, popping, or we might want to load the joint and see by by using our our by manual manipulation or having a bite on an anterior deprogrammer. And I think real important though. Probably no. I wouldn't say real. It's more important than the muscle or TMJ evaluation. Is look how wide can you open and how much can you move your jaw? And that's what these numbers here are. You know how wide the inner incisal opening is, and this is how far forward and backwards the jaw can go from the most retruded to the most protruded. Uh, because the more someone can move their jaw, the more we believe that we're going to be able to help them and uh, open up their airway in a comfortable position. So we want to note that. Uh, we want to note any deviations or deflections, and then. Uh, we're going to use uh, some a device we'll show you in a moment uh, to take a protrusive bite. Anything else on this, Rich? No, that's good. Okay, we're going right along. So we're going to take a protrusive bite, and uh, we can do this uh, in multiple ways. I think the next picture here. These are the two gauges that we use most commonly. There's other ones out there. Uh, I use the George gauge almost 100%. I think Rich used the Pro gauge mostly. Yeah, I use the ProGauge mostly. Sometimes we use the uh, airway metric. Sometimes we use the Android right. gauge. There's, you know, I, I, I just usually I go, hey, hand me that thing, right? whatever is laying on the counter there, and I, we, we use that. But again, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be forward, so it's open. Uh, I need four millimeters of posterior clearance. We have a little piece of acrylic that we made that's four millimeters thick, and we just, on the, with the ProGauge, the vertical comes in 6, 9, and 12. We take the 6, they bite in it, and if I can't get that 4 millimeters between it, then I go to the 9 because I need that posterior thickness in order for them to, to uh, you know, warranty the device. They're not going to make it. They're going to tell me, hey, we want another bite. So pay attention NDX's to the lab, lines. Make NDX's job easier. In other words, give them enough room yes. for the acrylic. Right. Makes, makes their job easier. So pay attention to the midlines document how far they can move forward, and then take a bite at a forward and comfortable position. Absolutely. And there's tons of videos on this. Uh, NDX has them on their website, uh, and uh, it's it, they're really quite simple to use. We take photos to document the bite uh, ahead of time. These are the ones I take. At the very least, I will take these three bottom ones uh, and or saving their study models for in case we ever have any tooth movement. But I. I, I prefer just to, to keep the photographs as my uh, part of my records, and I like to have a face photo. And, and we took this photo wrong. You want to pull the hair back out of the way, uh, so we want to really kind of look at the neck size there. So after we've done this exam, and again, that sounded like a lot, but honestly, it's five to seven minutes in my office, the exam and the bite. Uh, and by the time we're finished doing that, we, we know which device uh, uh, we're, we're going to do. Uh, we even enter, I don't think I put a slide in here of this, I probably should have, but we have, even have a device selector in our software that you can put in things like the nose and the, um, the clinching and cost, and, and it will actually sort the devices in order of preference with some algorithms Rich and I wrote. But uh, this is what a lot of people worry about, and I, I, I'm not saying it's unimportant, but in most cases it's it's not that important. Most devices work in most in most situations. What do you say, Rich? Yeah, I, I, I like to teach guy that you can't make a wrong device, but you can make a better device. So there you go. It, it's much more important that you just make them a device. So look at the NDX, look at that clear dream, and make 10 of them. And, and then go to the dream tab. So that those most of their labs to make those devices and you can do that and, and as you are learning this you're learning it so don't let that be a hang-up you know you like you said guy that's a big hang-up for a lot of dentists well which device do I make them 
you can't make them a wrong one. Just just make them one and get started. You know, turn around so I can kick you in the rear and we can get going. Don't let this be your hang up. It's just one of the things. It's one of the links in that chain, and and it's and it's not one that breaks real easily. So pick a device. Now we so we we keep walking these patients through. That's what this whole hour was supposed to be about. We've identified somebody. We've talked to them. We've got them. Uh, we we got all this information from their from from their questionnaire, and we 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 got them tested, and we you know we did the consultation, and we, we now we've gone through and we've done an exam, and you know now we picked a device out, and now we're going to start seeing these people back. So if if they're not going to wear their device, then all of this other stuff is moved. So we, we've got to have goals for doing it. I've got to make that device fit and it's got to be comfortable because if I don't, the patient's not going to want to wear it. That's your responsibility as a dentist. You've got to make it comfortable and don't start them too far forward. It's not an orthodontic uh, appliance. Now we, now we go back to when we, we did all of that information that we had from that questionnaire. What are their chief complaints? What are their symptoms? That's where this becomes important because that's part of our goal. You know, if the guy says, look, I know I have sleep apnea, I'm going to die, but I just want to sleep with my wife. You know, it's cold up here in Minnesota in the, in the winter time, and, and, you know, I just, I just want to not snore. So you've got to pay attention to all of those things. So do your part to make the device comfortable so they can wear it, manage their side effects, subjectively let's monitor what they're doing and then last but not least we want to get their RDI down and their oxygen up you know we want them to we want to treat their disease as well yeah very good we'll, we'll go into each of those but I've got to just make an announcement that that you can't promise that you make these devices and that the the wife still gonna, may not want to sleep with them. We can't <laughs> offer those kind of uh, <laughs> promises because it might not be snoring. But the way you worded that, let's just make sure we're we can get the snoring decreased most of the time. Uh, the, the rest of that's between them. Okay. All right. It's late here. I'm sorry about the the, the bad humor. But um, the way we're gonna do this now, subjectively, is again, like Rich said, we've got all these these symptoms that we already. Uh, documented at the consultation, and we're just going to ask them the same questions again. So you may not know what all these are, Epworth ESS, Thornton Snoring's level, energy levels, but what we're looking for is an improvement in the levels where it's going, you know, snoring's going down, the energy levels are going up, and we also want to know what their chief complaint was if it was snoring, and now the snoring went from a, a 9 to a 3, which is, you know, we don't always get rid of all the snoring. Uh, we usually take loud snores and make them heavy breathers, or sometimes it's completely gone. A lot of times it is, but not always. How are you happy with this? Oh, yeah, I'm thrilled. Yeah, my wife is back in the room. She doesn't have to wear earplugs anymore, and I'm thrilled. Just couldn't be any happier. Well, great. If they're not happy, then we're going to now, if they're comfortable, number one is wearing the device comfortably. Number two, these symptoms, we're going to go through a protocol of moving that device forward. I don't know. It depends on the device quarter millimeter, half millimeter forward uh, each week or so for a period of time. And the patient can do that themselves with your guidance or your sleep ambassador's guidance until we reach a point where the patient feels like I can't move forward. Or most of the time, they do get to the point where they're happy with the symptoms. Uh, the vast majority of the time in our office, the, the symptoms that they came in for are addressed. Does, do you find that to be true as well, Rich? Yes, I do. Okay. So again, so, you know, we would talk. The guy talked about the goals: is the the subjective. You know, they got to wear the device. The, we're looking at subjective, and then and then what, what do we have next, guy? We're moving on to objective. Yeah. So once the patient is, you know, we've moved the device, and a lot of times it's right where you took the the bite. They're thrilled, but maybe they're still snoring, and we have to go through a period of them adju adjusting it themselves for three or four weeks, and now the snoring's at an acceptable level. Uh, the patient's doing well, or their energy level, or their sleepiness, whatever their chief complaint was. And now we're, we want to make sure this device is still working. The more severe the patient was uh, at the baseline, the more this is really, really imperative to do. So uh, we, we need to do this through sleep testing. You can do it in the sleep lab. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on that tonight, but you can actually adjust the device in the sleep lab or have technicians advance it, wake them up, and advance the device. Uh, throughout the night, but the way we prefer to do it is, is to use a company that does at least two nights at home. Some of them do three nights, and we have them 
where the device where we believe it's working after they've titrated it, titrated it means adjusted it to, for their symptoms, and they're going to wear it the first night right there, and then the next night they're going to wear it a little more forward, and the last night they're going to wear it about as far forward as they feel comfortably they can wear it for one night if they have three nights. If you have two nights, you just get a little more forward with that. So here what we do and what we've made this simple is here's that baseline study in DS3. A 29 is the number of events an hour that patient has had, uh, and we have them do a three-night test that's automatically uploaded here, or you can manually enter it depending on how you order the test. And we can see they went from 29 to 19 to 8 to 6 events a night. And meanwhile, their oxygen levels are rising appropriately. So we know that that last position is really probably, in this case, where they want to be. Um, maybe uh, this, this position is the position that they were not snoring as much at. So we're going to have to give them instructions to slowly uh, move it out here after they've uh, backed up that last night. By the way, that last night, however, they rapidly advanced it. We have them back it up to where they had been wearing it for a while until we make a decision. This is all done seamlessly. I get a task in my inbox from my sleep ambassador saying, review this information, doctor, and make a decision. It takes me two minutes uh, to make a decision and write a progress note about what we, what we want to do. Anything I'm missing on that, Rich? No, but man, that guy, that's a long ways away from the dentist down the street because you, you guys don't do it this way now. The dentist down the street goes, hey, here's your dental device. Good luck. Hey, yeah. you're not snoring? Great. We're putting some science behind this. This We are making an informed decision. Remember, this guy, if he started at 30, he, he's 10 years you know, from now, he's probably going to be dead half the time. That's a severe. Forty-three percent. Yeah, and, and yeah that's 18. a severe patient. So we got to. Th this is serious business. We can't just kind of think about this. But when we do this in this fashion, and we're finally getting close to the end now. Here, we we've, we've taken a patient that just came in to get his teeth cleaned, and he was snoring while I was getting his teeth cleaned, and now we've treated his sleep apnea successfully. And, and when yeah. we think about how do we define success? We want to cut that number in half and get up below 10 for the AHI, cut it in half, get it below 15. You know, the reality is we want to get it as low as we can and we want to keep the oxygen as high as we can. Yeah, and if, you know, and I think this could be deceiving because if that guy had 45 events an hour and we got him down to 11 and he can't wear a CPAP or won't wear one, we've, we've dramatically helped his life. So uh, the subjective and the objective results are what we're looking for. We document that really well in DS3. And by the way, letters that we produce, it automatically spits these letters out, uh, digitally faxes them to their healthcare providers, highlighting the improvements in both subjective and objective testing. So billing, we do a whole webinar on billing. I looked, we did, we've done a lot of webinars on billing. Uh, I saw one on YouTube that we did years ago, had over 3,000 or near 3,000 views. So you can Google. Uh, those are go to YouTube. We don't have a whole lot of time to get into billing, uh, but I will give you the quick answer. The quick answer is if you're new to doing this, there are multiple companies out there, and we, we be in one of them, but we can even refer you to other ones, uh, that actually that's all they do is there are companies that they will do the billing for medical billing for you, and they will help you with that. They'll take a small percentage of what they collect from patients. Most of them do. Uh, they have different billing models, but let them help you at the beginning. Uh, as you start doing uh, a dozen of these a month, then maybe you want to take that over in your own office. But until then, uh, it will save you time and money. And, and it, this pillar goes from being the biggest pillar to the smallest with the help of a third-party biller like Dental Sleep Solutions, Eureka Billing, uh, Google Billing, some of the companies that we use. So, man, we're about making it through on time here, Rich. I think we just got a couple more slides to go, but as, uh, these are the steps. Nothing's terribly difficult about any of them. Uh, did we forget any, a six-month recall when we're finished? We like to see our patients first time about six months just to make sure everything's good, bites okay, no TMD problems, and they're wearing the device. And then after that, I like to see our patients about once a year. Did, did we forget anything on all the steps? Is anything harder? No, that's pretty good. Man. I mean, you know, we've, we've walked this patient now from being in your office to, you know, having treated them successfully. Now, there are a couple of hurdles. We had a couple of questions about, you know, sleep testing and things like that. And I know Jason was helping us answer some of those questions tonight. And if we didn't answer those, give us a call. I mean, we're, we're glad to help you in anything that we can do. So uh, DS3 is an experience. You know, we, we help dentists become more successful in dental sleep.
That's what we do. And when you sign up with us, uh, we, we help you do that. You can, I know several of you have typed in trial, several people have typed in course. We'll get in touch with you, figure out which course you want to go to, and, and we can show you a trial because, you know, this is really something that, uh, you know, Guy, I think most people who are hesitant about doing this, they think, well, you know, I'll do a few cases and then we'll do it. And, and I, the analogy I like to use is, is the golf swing. You know, you don't you get get a golf lesson before you go out and try to you know pick up some bad habits because we've got everything there for you and uh, we're here to help anyway. We yeah, and again for those who came on a little later, if you want, to, uh, we have uh, a lot of this education built right into DS3, and you can try it out for a couple of weeks. Just type trial, and uh, one of our team will give you a demo of it. Uh, we're not high pressure people, no obligation, but I think you'll see if you want to get involved, it'll sleep. Everything you need is packaged right there, and you can you can try it out online uh, uh, for free. And the courses again are fifty dollars off for a one day and two hundred for a two day, and no no obligation there either. But if you go and type in course, then we'll contact you, and if one fits into your schedule, uh, you'll you'll secure that uh, that that discount. Uh, on, on the course itself. Uh, the CE, the CE certificates, remember, yeah. NDX is going to provide the CE for you. You will get that, we promise. Yes, and there are some dates of the courses. We do have more than this. I have to go all the way to Hawaii here in a few weeks. It's just horrible. I don't know how I got that short straw. So uh, <laughs> being uh, sarcastic there. Thanks for taking one for the team there. Yeah, 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 yeah. My family's really upset that they, they're going to drag it along with me, I think. But uh, we've got courses all over. And again, I think this uh, is, there's actually some that aren't on here. And I do want to mention this is totally free. Uh, Dental Sleep Medicine Insider, there'll be a new one coming out in a few weeks. Every two months we put this magazine out. It's a digital magazine. comes right to your inbox, and it's free. Uh, and we do videos. I typically do a video. Rich writes articles. We have a lot of guests, uh, contributors to it, and it's real. If you liked what we did tonight, everything we do, I hope, is very practical. This is what, you know, teaching you how to do this. And this magazine, uh, just go to that website and you can sign up. You can even see all the back issues there as well if you want. So there's our contact information, too. And man, look at that. Got done. I thought that was going to be a little tight. We pretty much finish on time. I'm happy to hang out here and answer any. I know you've all been answering some of these questions through here. Uh, yeah, you can just type in magazine too if you want someone to, if you don't feel like going there, we'll, we'll find a way to get that to you too. So um, yeah, this uh, month uh, I'm talking about uh, on, on what you uh, take with you and what you say when you go meet physicians uh, for the first time, you know, so how does that conversation go? So uh, what is the average reimbursement for appliances? Uh, I could answer that verbally instead of typing that in. You know, that, that's the answer that we're always going to give for this, right, Rich? It depends. It depends on what you charge. It depends on if you're in or out of network. Uh, it depends on where you live. Um, I can tell you the reverse of this is if you do this efficiently and you get uh, 1,000 to 1,500 appliance, you're making as much money as you do most other procedures. The ranges that we see from medical reimbursement range from anywhere from the Medicare being the lowest in some areas, 1,000, and over $6,000 we see as allowable amounts sometimes. So I hope that answers that question. Yeah, we got another one about Medicare. So, you know, we do a whole hour presentation on Medicare. And, and you, you, as a cardiologist, you have to participate uh, some dentists non-participate, but if you become a DME supplier through the 855S, then you can choose to participate or non-participate on a case-by-case basis. So you can uh, accept Medicare's fee if you want, or you can not accept Medicare's right. fee and balance bill the patient. So that's our recommendation. 855S, you become a DME supplier, and, and then you can you can do that uh, on your own. But and, and we also, you know, in, in uh, DS3, we have a lot of this stuff in, in our Snoozle, which is our online education portal that we look at for, for you to look at this kind of stuff. So the, these are part of the thousand questions, I think, that you have guys to get started in this, aren't they? You know, all right. of these things and what, what do you do? And the answer to the last two questions I see here, one is uh, do you ask the patients to pay in full up front or get reimbursed? It really just depends on your policy. What, what we teach is you've got to decide on what you want to do. Do you want to be a fee-for-service? Do you want to uh, be uh, in-network? Do you want to be out-of-network? I see someone here put sleep impressions has a chart of reimbursements. That's true, 
that's for their contracted rates for in-network. So that's not necessarily what you would get if you were out of network. You might actually get a good deal more than that or less depending on your on your situation. So uh, that just I can't say how you normally do it. In my office, we try to work with each patient individually and oftentimes we will accept some insurance monies or all of them coming to us depending on how badly the patient needs a treatment and how uh, strapped they are for money. We try to try to make it affordable. Overall, it's become very, very profitable to the point where I had to sell my, my dental office because I had to choose and it's uh, doing as well as a, as a very lucrative dental office. So we, the sky is kind of the limit. Uh, we don't say that everybody needs to go that extreme with it in their practice, but you could certainly make money having a plan is the number one thing. So uh, you can't be all over the board being fee for service and trying to be in network on some, and you just got to have a plan for each person that walks through the door. Yeah, I, I think I'd like to add to that, guy. You know, if you want to do insurance in, and you, you, you know, then try to get in network. If you don't want to do insurance, you want to be fee for service, then do it, do it out of network as long as you can. Uh, we had a question about mixed dentition. No, you know, unless you're an, an orthodontist, Dr. Abel, uh, you know, orthodontists do this in mixed dentitions because they put in herpes devices and they grow jaws. They expand uh, palates. They're basically uh, keeping that patient from becoming a sleep apnea patient in my office 20 to 30 years later. But we don't make mandibular repositioning devices for patients until w really they stop growing. So right. for females, that's in the late teens. For males, that's in the early 20s. You know, occasionally, I've got a couple of 16, 17-year-old kids that we have in mandibular repositioning devices. But we alternate every three or four days with a mandib with, with CPAP, you know. So we're, we're doing a couple of things. So, But in general, you know, with kids, we take out tonsils and adenoids. We expand their arches and grow their jaws. Uh, but we don't treat them with mandibular repositioning devices until we get uh, in the early 20s. For the yeah, and find an orthodontist in your area if you're not one uh, that uh, understands uh, that the uh, orthodontics involves the airway um, probably more so than most other uh, uh, things uh, that we do in dentistry, and, and they need to understand that the goal is not just to get the teeth looking straight. The goal is to um, you get these palates dropped and airways more open than and things like that. So that's a great question. Uh, again, that, uh, is, that is a really good question. We love those kinds of questions because it shows that you're thinking about it. You know, uh, when we see kids come in the practice and we look at that and we say, "Holy cow!" You know, look, his tonsils are touching. Uh, how's he doing in school? Does he snore? Is he grinding his teeth? You know, man, get a good orthodontist. Get a good ear, nose, and throat in your community where you can talk to people about that kind of stuff and help help those patients. That's another thing that helps grow your dental practice. You know, Dr. Drake fixed wow. Johnny's bedwetting, you know, and, and they refer you patients. Oh, and huge, what you did was huge growth. Uh, our screener is a separate, uh, well, it's not really separate, but it's a separate database of our DS3 system, and it tracks everyone with screen and ranks them. You can put them in order high to low, and uh, you can actually, if you decide to order a sleep test through there, it uh, puts it in queues where you can follow through with them. So uh, it does that very, very nicely. Everything that we do, we do to try to make this process uh, less cumbersome to the dentist. What we found after doing this for years and trying to train other dentists is it's it just uh, it's all the paperwork, all the systems. People tried to manage it uh, with their existing systems, and they weren't built for that. And that's why we built DS3 to manage this and make each of these steps easier, so that you don't have a bunch of data that uh, is unmanageable. Uh, the answer to the question is: Does it uh, does it link with other uh, soft uh, softwares? Uh, we are working, having a meeting about that, as a matter of fact, tomorrow. So uh, stay tuned. Um, it uh, looks like uh, with uh, at least uh, uh, one of the ones you had listed there, uh, Dentrix, that we're, we're in um, the process of, of looking into that uh, as they're opening that up to, to availability for us. So um, stay tuned. It should be hopefully uh, in the not-so-distant future. Uh, do, you have, do we have letters that allow you to market? You know, uh, <laughs> you don't have to have letters to market them. I mean, well, yes, the answer is yes, we do. But what we also recommend is that each treatment step that we went through tonight, from impressions to, to device checks to if they decide not to do treatment, you should send letters with your um, 
to all the health care providers that, that work with that patient. And that is in itself a good idea from a, a communication, but it's also marketing. How many letters have you sent this year, Rich? I know you look at that ever so often. Did I lose you? I don't hear anybody. Maybe I'm muted. Guess we've ended this. Hello? Yeah, you can still hear me. Okay, I can't hear Rich for some reason. No, I cannot hear you. So I can't hear Rich, but I know Rich has sent, uh, <laughs> uh, I talked to him a few months ago, uh, and at the, toward the end of last year, it was in the thousands that he sends through his uh, um through his uh, through DS3 through that uh, automatic faxing and those are in fact a lot uh, they're for treatment but those are one of the best ways to market and when you do that you follow up with a phone call or two so that's part of actually tune into that dental sleep medicine insider uh, this month coming out because that's actually talk about how you use those letters and then the follow-up uh, uh, marketing with them is it helpful to use digital impressions? Rich, I wish his microphone was working, but Rich has digital impressions. He loves them. I have not purchased those yet, but certain labs do uh, do uh, take those digital files. So uh, Rich could answer that. And again, anybody, uh, we're going to get off in just a little bit. So if last chance here shortly to type in trial or course if you want to secure a discount on any of those. I think... Uh, Got to most of the questions. Thanks, Scott Trump was on. That's true. <laughs> uh, yeah, digital impression. You can hear me. So I don't see any. Yeah, if anybody else, I'm gonna uh, unless we have other questions and Rich's sound has gotten muted for some reason. I'll uh, I'll uh, kick down for just a minute more. Again, type trial or course if you want that. Uh, you the bite. How do you do the bite? You still need to do a, a George Gage bite, but I think you can scan. The bite too is another way. I know that when we send them to certain labs, sometimes that's uh, they they accept those. So, all right. Anything else? Yeah, you all are welcome. I hope it was beneficial. Uh, I think we have another one of these coming up. If Jason, you're still on here, if you know, type that in. If there is, uh, we I know we have another one scheduled. Um, I should have looked at that before I got on tonight, but I've had a busy day and I neglected to do that. Um, we don't have the PowerPoint, but if you have any specifics you want from this, uh, we make it available to all of our DS3 members, any of the material that we do. Uh, and even if you're not a DS3 member, uh, if you just wanted a few slides, if you'll contact the team there, we can probably help you out uh, with that. But uh, we actually have PowerPoints that we uh, provide as part of our onboarding package for our DS3 members. Okay. Yeah, looking through the score schedule tonight. Um, looking forward to seeing one of you all there. The next webinar is March 28th, it says here. So, uh, and I don't know the subject. Uh, oh, dental device selection. So that's one of the reasons we bro breezed through it. So we will uh, spend an hour uh, mostly on which device to, to use where because uh, we didn't have obviously enough time tonight with that. So look through the course schedule. We enjoyed everyone. Uh, uh, being on here and thanks for the really great questions by the way so um yeah, a, lot of, a lot of good can you find oh, there you are you're back yeah sorry my my computer died there i was trying to run and get my uh power cord without losing everybody there uh, did you guys oh, answer the one about uh, digital impressions well, go ahead and uh, i i had lived it but uh, <laughs> i haven't used them so i just know what you've told me so go ahead no, and I, answer. You know, I, i've been doing them for over three years now so you know we we used itero i've used the serona um uh, one that uh, KKGI puts out, and I've used the CareStream. I've used four different ones now, and we've done very well with all of them. We're actually taking uh, a bite now uh, with with uh, with the Pro Gauge or George Gauge, and and then we after we do upper and lower scans, and then we just scan the bite, and they actually print the bite wafer then. So some of the labs, so we don't actually have to mail anything now. We're just doing the upper scan, the lower scan. We do the bite. We actually scan the bite, and then we send it all off, and it all gets printed and made. So it's, man, it's uh, it's it's slick when it works, and it works most of the time. We very seldom do we we take impressions anymore. Usually that's on the guy with the tongue that you know covers his teeth and the assistant's in there and she can't get the tongue out of the way. And that that guy's a tough impression, but is even tougher to get a scan on. Okay. So it looks well, good. I so, there too. 
So let's yeah, fantastic. Yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, next, next time we'll be talking about, you know, uh, I told you you can't make the wrong device, but you can make a better one. And we're going to talk about all of those things that, that help you choose a better device the first time around. And that, that really helps the dentist get a lot more confident. So we, we hope you guys will tune in for us. Yeah, I think we'll I think stay on that's... a few more minutes, Guy, because there's so many people typing in stuff, if that's okay. Yeah, I'll stay on. You have to go to Hawaii tonight, do you? No, a couple oh. weeks. Yeah, I go into, I think we have a course in St. Louis between now and then. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, week, not this weekend, but next weekend. So, um, yeah, I think that was good. Um, we had You had one in Arizona last weekend, I heard, went well. Um, uh, yeah, EagleSoft, I... uh, we're, we're working, uh, uh, not currently is the answer, but we're working on some systems for other, other ones besides the, the Dentrix. Yeah, that was a great decision we made, Guy, years ago, was to go to a cloud-based system. So I think we're a little bit ahead of everybody else now because we, we everything we do is in the uh, in the cloud. So we're we're kind of waiting for other people to catch us, and we're we're talking to these people, and we're trying to make something like that work. So sounds right. like Dr. Abel said he can write off his honeymoon by taking. There you go. Show up. It's going to be a. It's on a Thursday there in Hawaii. Apparently, that's the day they like to have meetings there. So. There you go, exactly. Write the whole thing off. I'm not sure that'd be off to a good start, though, taking a course on your honeymoon. <laughs> Maybe just... <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, other people putting in here, so... That was good. Thank you, guys, for putting uh, all that stuff together. Uh, hopefully, you guys got a real good feel for, you know, what actually happens when... Uh, you know, this, this whole workflow for how do you take a patient, you know, that, that needs a sleep test. You know, we, we've got to get them sleep tested. So you've got to figure out a way to do that. Uh, we've lowered the barrier for some of that by putting a button in there and doing that kind of stuff. But you've you got you to gotta talk to physicians, though. You've got to, you, you know, you got to talk to patients. You've got to talk to physicians. You've got to, I think the best advice guy we talked about was getting that sleep ambassador. You know, our, our members who, who hire that sleep ambassador, they do so well, so well. Let's type that one in. It, it is certified. I mean, it... Uh... It is both HIPAA and high-tech compliant, and it is an EMR certified software as a service. So, yes. You know, our software, our cloud-based software is now an enterprise-level software, which means we have 100,000 page requests a week on it now from all of our members. So, um, oh, Well, that's the latest we've been on in a bit. That was a good one. Um, I, think, I think everybody's probably ready to go do what they do on Tuesday nights besides listen to <laughs> Rich and Guy show here, but uh, uh, yes, they are. All right, well, you all have a good night. You don't have to stay on to get your CE, by the way. We're just staying. Uh, you'll be getting that regardless. Uh, so uh, we were just wanting to make sure we adhered to what we said um, and stayed on as long as the questions kept coming, which I think they've slowed down. So thank you, everyone. Uh, we look forward to uh, next month when we talk about dental device selection and how to make a better device. I like that title. Maybe we'll have to change the name of Thank you all. Yeah, I like that too.